One of the most contentious subjects in the lost mythology is actually a technicality. The question is, when did the purge of the Dharma initiative take place on the island? However, it is not such a simple question to answer, as we will discover. Because conflicting information on the subject exists both within the actual narrative, and sources external to that narrative. There are two possibilities for when the purge takes place, based on information that the show and certain external sources present us with. Before we delve too deeply into these arguments, it is important to restate up front. This channel does not accept anything that exists outside of the show to be canonical beyond the epilogue and, to a lesser extent, the lost missing pieces. While it can be helpful to find quotes and supplementary materials that help to reinforce our own theories and ideas, the only source that ultimately matters is the narrative of the television series itself. If the information is not mentioned or definitively stated within the show, then it can always be contested and debated further. Lost, as a story, must ultimately speak for itself, and be the primary evidence for any textual or subtextual readings. However, with that in mind, for the purposes of this FAQ, we will need to draw upon many different sources to help figure out why the answer to this question is so contentious within the fanbase. And why a definitive answer can be hard to identify. But, let's start simply. What exactly was the purge? These are my people. The Dharma Initiative. They came here seeking harmony. They couldn't even coexist with the island's original inhabitants. And when it became clear that one side had to go, one side had to be purged, I did what I had to do. The purge was an island genocide in which the others, aka the hostiles, executed the majority of the Dharma Initiative colony that lived on the island. They did this by channeling toxic gas from the Tempest Station directly into the pipelines of the Dharma Barracks. This release of gas was clearly concentrated in this particular valley and only affected these barracks. It was not island-wide, as many often claim. We know the toxic gas only contaminated the barracks because Ben had to kill his own father separately up on the ridge in the van, which means the Tempest gas did not reach this far out. We also know that many other Dharma members who were not at the barracks were gathered together and executed by gunshot and dumped into the pit. If the gas had covered the whole island then there would have been no need to shoot anyone. Furthermore, the others would not want to risk killing any of their own people in the process, and they certainly did not want to kill any of the surrounding wildlife. The others still relied upon animals and vegetation for their own sustenance at that point in time. It would make no sense to contaminate the entire island. They also wouldn't want the gas potentially affecting Jacob, since they didn't know where he lived. So, the Tempest sabotage was a targeted attack on the barracks and nowhere else. But when did the gas actually get released? What was the timeline when this took place? All we know for sure is that it happened on December 19th because it was Benjamin Linus' birthday. Let's look at the first possibility, that the purge took place on December 19, 1992. In Season 3 episode, The Man Behind the Curtain, we witnessed the purge of Dharma take place. At this point in the canon of the show, the year was intended to be 1992. The script for this episode is available online, and it confirms that 1992 was the date intended at the time the story was first produced. You can see 1992 in parenthesis. However, this is a very good example of how external source materials, particularly older ones, cannot be used as a way of definitively proving theories or interpretations. Because if we look through all of the pages of this script from 2007, there are other details that are no longer considered canonical as far as the mythology is concerned. The best example of this is the scene in the cabin between Ben and Locke. In 2007, it was clearly written to convey the idea that Ben absolutely believes Jacob is in the cabin and that Locke simply cannot see him. But, as we find out later in the season 5 finale, Ben was merely pretending to see and hear Jacob. I mention this primarily to disabuse anyone of the notion that just because an original script states an intention or an idea, or seemingly confirms information to us, it does not supersede the show itself, especially if the show later retcons that information. We know that the writers ended up changing directions on this scene in the cabin at a later date, around season 4. They made it so that Ben was indeed faking his interactions with the invisible presence. 
and it wasn't even Jacob in the cabin at all, but the man in black instead. This is why supplementary materials can only be used as a guide. Not confirmation. Keep this in mind as we move through these arguments. Regardless of this parenthesis in an old script, 1992 is actually confirmed, canonically, within the show through actual dialogue. It happens in the dream that John Locke has of Horace Goodspeed in Season 4 episode Cabin Fever. Horace says that he has been dead for 12 years. I'm not making any sense, am I? No. That's probably because I've been dead for 12 years. At this point in the show, the year is 2004. Twelve years prior to 2004 would have been the year 1992. Now, with this being a dream, it makes any and all of the information slightly questionable. After all, Horace also claims that Jacob is waiting for Locke in the cabin. But we know that turns out to not be true. It's actually the man in black. But at least that misinformation that Dream Horace gives to Locke has a genuine intention behind it. Because Locke needs to believe that the man in the cabin is, essentially, speaking on behalf of the island. This channel has stated on many occasions that the island is responsible for all of the dreams. Indeed, the island is the catalyst for everything that occurs throughout the series. But whether you agree that the island is the source of the dreams or not, what Locke experiences in Cabin Fever is very specific. And this dream has no logical reason to get the number of years wrong that Horace Goodspeed has been dead. So, we cannot simply dismiss this statement. Dream Horace is claiming to have died in 1992. Those that support 1987 as the true purge date try to explain away this discrepancy by making the claim that Dream Horace is stuck in some kind of stasis or loop within the dream. He does appear to be part of a repeating pattern. Cutting down the tree over and over. Giving out the same information again and again. Much like a pre-recorded message. However, why would Dream Horace be stuck in this loop? It requires too much theory crafting to explain it. Furthermore, in order for 12 years to lead back to 1987, that would mean this dream loop began in the year 1999. Which is a year of no particular significance to the mythology. 1992 is once again seemingly confirmed by the recruitment of Kelvin Inman to the Dharma Initiative. Chronologically, the last we saw of Kelvin was fighting in the Gulf War and training Saeed Jara in how to torture people. The Gulf War took place between 1990 and 1991. So, if Dharma was operational on the island until 1992, Kelvin being recruited soon after his service in the military fits that timeline. We will circle back to Kelvin later. Because his recruitment to Dharma does not really prove nor disprove either possibility. In fact, his relationship to the purge, pre or post, makes no difference. But, I promise that we will get to that. So, you might ask yourself, what exactly is the issue with the purge taking place in the year 1992? Well, the problem is that it gets contradicted by several other details we learn later in the series. We see both young Ben and young Ethan working with the others in 1988. Some fans view this whole scene as simply being part of one of many initiations that the hostiles made Dharma defectors go through before they could officially join their ranks. We know that Ben was living a double life since childhood. We also know that he was most likely the key recruiter of people from within Dharma over the course of several years, and was just one of several defectors, which possibly numbers into double figures. What we see taking place in 1988 with Danielle Russo could reasonably be one of many midnight missions that Dharma defectors were required to carry out in order to test their allegiance and skill sets. Like Richard Alpert said to young Ben in 1973, becoming one of them would require a lot of patience. These are perfectly plausible explanations. But let's go further back in time from 1992 and see what an alternative year for the purge might have looked like. So, why 1987? We know that by the time we see Ben and Ethan outside Danielle's beach camp, the year is definitely 1988. Because Danielle did not arrive on the island until 1988. We do not know the exact date of her arrival but Lostpedia puts Alexandra Russo's birth date as being in the month of April. Therefore, if we are to accept that date's accuracy, then the French team shipwrecked onto the island sometime in February, 1988. While many of Danielle's initial claims appear to be inconsistent based on the length of time she spent in isolation and dealing with her mental trauma, we know for certain that she was definitely on the island for 16 years. 
This is based on the counter that Saeed decodes from the radio tower broadcast. Danielle claimed that her team survived for two months before she was forced to kill all of them. And after that she hiked to the radio tower to change the broadcast. Three days later, she delivered her own baby and was with Alex for a week before the others came and took her away. So, there is no doubt that the events we see unfolding with Ben and Danielle on the beach are happening in early 1988. Why does this sequence of events involving Russo matter in regards to the purge, you might ask? Well, it means that the purge must have taken place in December, the previous year. 1987, because Ben already appears to be one of the others at this point in time. This also means that Russo was not on the island when the genocide took place several months before her arrival. If 1987 is the correct year, then it would also help to explain why she never encountered any active Dharma members or Dharma sites during the preceding years. The others knew how to hide from strangers, but Dharma were fairly prolific in their exploration of the island. Russo may have kept to her patch for a long time and avoided any sign of other people, heeding Ben's warning. But, you have to ask yourself, is it reasonable to accept that, in those five years between 1988 and 1992, Russo never came across a single person from the initiative? We know she had no interactions with Dharma because she has no familiarity with Dharma stations and is just as surprised as everyone else to come across them. This channel accepts that Russo was reclusive enough that she never really left her side of the island and stuck to the jungle. If 1992 remains an accurate purge date then Russo would have been on island for the gas attack. But, as previously stated, the Tempest was used for a targeted attack on the barracks. It wasn't island-wide. Danielle was camped deep in the jungle on the other side of the island and, therefore, was nowhere near any of the hot zones. A lot of the support for the 1987 purge date has been reinforced by external sources to the show. We definitely need to discuss them, because if we are going to use supplementary media like original episode scripts then we must also include mention of the Lost Encyclopedia, and its entry on the purge. Now, the Lost Encyclopedia is a bit of a contentious source. I might make a separate video on this subject at a later date because many people often reach for the answers contained within that book and use them as a crutch. This book details all the information that was either mentioned or alluded to within the series. More importantly, it was endorsed by showrunners Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse, who wrote the foreword. However, they explain up front how this is not, I repeat, not, a book of answers that will confirm nor deny theories. It is simply intended to be a guide for referencing and clarity. The problem is that the book infamously contains a number of factual errors, typos and inconsistencies that clash with the actual show. This throws up questions regarding its veracity, and its canonical significance. The encyclopedia cannot be used like a Bible. Please visit Lostpedia to see a full list of all the errors and erroneous conclusions that the book contains. It's a surprisingly long list. For argument's sake, let us ignore the questionable accuracy of the book for now. Because the encyclopedia does definitively state that the purge took place approximately 15 years after the signing of the truce between the others and the Dharma Initiative. According to the encyclopedia, the truce was signed on August the 15th, in 1973. If we do the math on this, 15 years on from 1973 puts us right around 1988. Another external source to the show helps to reinforce this claim. Showrunners Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse appear to confirm that the purge took place earlier than 1992 in this interview excerpt. Sir, we were talking about the purge. And this just gives you a little bit of a sense of where we're going in season five. The purge is going to be something that, that, that comes up. And when it happened, and we know when it happened, but we were, we were asking Greg Nations, our trusty script uh, supervisor and, and keeper of all things uh, uh, the historical uh, continuity, record. you know, what have we told the audience about when the purge happened? And he goes, well, all they really have to go on is that Kelvin recruited Saeed during the first Gulf War and yet somehow managed, on the, uh, managed to get to the island and to push the button in the hatch. So the assumption would be that the Dharma Initiative was still up and running um, in the post, early 90s. Post, yeah, Iraq War I. And we said, that's their assumption, but, but is that the truth, Carlton? Mm. Is it possible that the Dharma Initiative recruited somebody after the purge? It is entirely possible that they recruited somebody after the purge. Is it likely? That I don't want to say. Okay. As always, take what the showrunners say with a pinch of salt here because they fail to make mention of the dream involving Horace Goodspeed. 
a scene with exposition that directly told the audience the number of years it had been since he was killed. Damon and Carlton's neglect in forgetting to mention this important detail is either an accidental oversight, or a deliberate attempt to glide over the retcon. And this is why it is up to us, as fans, to iron out the creases and discrepancies in the story, not the creators. So, ignoring these external sources and supplementary materials on this subject, let's look at the actual show itself and see what canonical evidence exists within the narrative that might support 1987 as the purge date. If this scene is happening in 1992 then Ben is still a fully-fledged member of the initiative. Which means he hasn't officially defected yet. So, what is he doing five years prior to this living and working with the others in the jungle in 1988? Why does he have a young Ethan Goodspeed with him? Why are they kidnapping Alex? If this is taking place before the purge, then this whole flashback doesn't fit with the timeline. Some fans believe that Ben and Ethan were simply sneaking away from the barracks and running around with the others at night. To observe, to learn, to prove their worth. And, while this seems like a needless risk, this remains a distinct possibility. After all, Ben needed to move back and forth between the two groups for many years. There is no point in becoming a spy if you can't move between worlds. It can be argued that the killing of Danielle Russo and her newborn baby was a mission that Ben was given by Charles Widmore because he was being tested. To see if he was worthy of joining the others. And while he fails this first test, he wins the admiration and respect of some of the others. But he still must prove his loyalty, which leads him to sacrificing his father several years later. And that becomes his show of commitment to the others and to the island. However, a few things don't sit right with this analysis. When we see Ben amongst the others in 1988, it appears that he has been with them in the jungle for a while. Long enough to be able to challenge their leader, Charles Widmore, and his morality in front of the whole community. If he were still on a probationary period and not even a fully-fledged member, then would something like this really happen? After all, if the purge has yet to take place, that means Ben has not proven his commitment to the island in any significant way yet. How much power and influence would he really have in this scene? What is stopping the ruthless Charles Widmore from having Ben executed right there and then? It could be Richard, or even Jacob, standing in Widmore's way. Ben might be off limits. Either way, this scene raises questions as to Ben's placing in the power hierarchy at this moment in time. Perhaps Widmore could not kill Ben because, whether he liked it or not, killing one of your own was against the rules. And with Ben being healed in their sacred spring waters as a boy, it meant that he was already one of them to some extent. Richard Alpert claimed this was the case at the time. So, Ben killing his own father was really just making the whole thing official. I think you can make some fairly reasonable arguments as to why Ben is sneaking around with the others at night in 1988 whilst still living with Dharma until 1992. The two elements that are much harder to explain and justify about these flashbacks from Dead is Dead, if it is indeed supposed to be taking place pre-purge, is the presence of Ethan Goodspeed and Alexandra Russo. At this point in the game, Ben's allegiance with the others would need to be incredibly secret and he would have to be very cautious in any rendezvous with them. He most certainly would have clandestine meetings with his future people, but is it credible that he would bring a young boy like Ethan along with him from the Dharma barracks? You would think that Horace and Amy Goodspeed would know if their 10-year-old son was missing. Unless Ben and Ethan snuck out in the very late hours of the night using the tunnels, then returned before first light. Regardless of the logistics, bringing Ethan along for an initiation seems like an unnecessary risk. The only reason a young boy like Ethan would be going out on missions with the others is because he is with them full time. Even though young Ben was shot and healed in the Temple Spring in 1977, the others returned him to Dharma shortly thereafter. Because, as we saw in Season 5, Dharma knows when their kids go missing. And Ben grows up to become a trusted member of the Dharma inner circle. No one ever suspects that he was a mole when he came back fully recovered after being missing for a day. Not that we ever hear about anyway. The second problem is Alexandra Russo. We know she is a newborn at this point in time in 1988. We also know that Widmore wanted both mother and baby dead. If this is taking place before the purge in 1992 then that means Ben is still a mole embedded with Dharma during the day. So, who looks after Alex for the next five years? Would Ben leave this baby unsupervised amongst the others whilst he goes back to working for the initiative? Would he not fear that Widmore might get someone else to kill the child in his absence? 
The only way of protecting Alex is by taking her with him. We know she is already calling him dad by 1992 when we see her on the swing in the barracks, which means Ben has been raising her in person for years. If Dharma was still active on the island in 1988 then how did he explain this baby to them? Why are there no signs nor mentions of a little girl in the lives of the Linus men? Her omission here seems significant when looking back, and undermines the 1992 date a little bit. It is possible that Alex was brought back to the barracks in 1988 to be raised internally and Ben simply concocted a story about how he found her abandoned in the jungle. Dharma already believed that the hostiles were close to being backward savages, so they might accept such a story. And perhaps the reason why we see the figurines that Annie made laid out on the table on Ben's birthday is so that little Alex can play with them. What actually makes more sense is that Ben started to raise Alex during the spring of 1988 whilst living amongst the others, under Charles Widmore's rule. Because Dharma had already been wiped out. And it is raising Alex in this harsh jungle environment that ultimately motivated him to want to overthrow Widmore and move the others into the barracks. To finally bring these island natives into the 20th century. More importantly, there would be better facilities for raising a child there. And Ben can then have the best of both worlds. Whether it was 1987 or 1992, Ben had to split his time between his Dharma home on the barracks and his new people in the jungle until the day of the purge. Leading this complicated double life and lying about who he was to everyone around him is exactly how the man got so good at lying in the first place. He spent, at least, 10 years pretending to be someone he wasn't. There might be a few of you wondering or wanting to ask the question. How did this all get so damn complicated? Why is such a simple question so hard to answer? So, let's talk about it. For those of you who have never heard of the term, retcon, it is an abbreviation for something known as retroactive continuity. The Google definition explains that to retcon, something means to revise a fictional work retrospectively, typically by introducing a piece of new information that imposes a different interpretation on previously described events. Lost is a show that did this more than once. The mythology was malleable to a certain extent, which made it possible for the writers to change direction on certain ideas. The Purge is the biggest example of retconning within the series. A useful way to view Lost is to take the final information the show gave us on an issue, and apply it retroactively to what came before, even if that throws up some inconsistencies. Basically, you start from the end and work your way backwards. That's why Across the Sea helps to explain so much about the narrative once you reverse engineer the logic behind it. Retroactive continuity isn't always the preferred storytelling method, but it is the reality of telling a serialized story on network television for over half a decade. The writers needed to change the gears from time to time in order to evolve the story in a way that suited the requirements of each new season. By season 5 and season 6, they were in their endgame and had decided what everything was going to mean and why. They changed their minds along the way on various mysteries and answers, which is why season 5 and 6 are so important to consider in terms of what is revealed. 99% of the time, we have to use the answers those seasons gave us as a key to unlocking everything that came before. Not vice versa. In season 1 episode Solitary, the whispers Saeed heard might well have been intended to be the voices of the others, and not the voices of the dead. Former staff writer David Fury has actually gone on record saying that the whispers were supposed to be the others during that first season. But that doesn't matter anymore because the writers eventually settled on what the whispers were by the time the show concluded. Now we have to apply that answer to what came before. You're stuck on the island, aren't you? Because of what I did. And... There are others out here, like you, aren't there? That's what the whispers are? Yeah. We're the ones who can't move on. Looking back at the early scenes involving the whispers, this answer still makes sense without contradicting what we saw. Sometimes the whispers showed up when the others did. But other times the whispers showed up in situations where that could not possibly be the case. If anything, once we found out who the others really were and how they operated, the notion that these whispers were supposed to be from people like Tom Friendly and Danny Pickett start to make less sense, and even seem laughable. 
In other words, this retcon works, and actually improves upon the original answer behind the mystery. It also ties into the themes of death and the afterlife, which play a significant role in season 6. Basically, what happened last matters most. By this measure, it seems that the writers wanted us to consider 1987 as the likely year that the purge took place. But, the reality is, these date disparities are the result of a large retcon by the writers. In season 3, the year was supposed to be 1992, as proven definitively by the official script and Dream Horace's statement in season 4. But by season 5, the date was recalibrated to be 1987. Or, at least made us question the original 1992 date. The honest answer is, there is strong evidence to support the purge as being both dates. So, you work with the Dharma Initiative? The Dharma Initiative hasn't existed in almost 20 years. In the epilogue for the series, The New Man in Charge, Ben confirms that the purge happened roughly 20 years ago. According to the printout on the automated printer, the date of this interaction is August, 2010. Which means almost 20 years ago would roughly place us sometime around 1990. This essentially puts the purge date right smack in between 1987 and 1992. I suspect that this may have been somewhat of an intentional joke on behalf of the writer's room rather than an oversight. It's a way of quietly communicating the idea that this question has two possible answers, both with contradictions. And neither of which they are prepared to fully erase from the canon. Is it possible that the Dharma Initiative recruited somebody after the purge? It is entirely possible that they recruited somebody after the purge. Is it likely? That I don't want to say. Okay. Well, I don't want to say, hopefully this answers your question. This was a good question. After the others purged the Dharma colony on the island, they kept up the pretense and illusion to the outside world that everything was still functioning normally. They continued operations as if Dharma were still active on the island. If enough initiative members had defected to the others then they could have pulled off such a ruse, at least until they figured out a way to take over the organization on the outside. I make an allusion to this possibility in my video on the Dharma Initiative. Ben and various other defectors, such as Tom Friendly, Mikhail Bakunin, and Ethan Goodspeed, were all official members and could realistically keep this ruse going for a long time after the purge. They know all of the processes, codes and protocols. Ben could have become the main point of contact with the Ann Arbor outpost. And this would buy the others enough time to infiltrate the Dharma bases off-island, as well as control and absorb any new recruits being selected and sent to the island. As long as the others controlled the stations and on-island operations, they could continue the masquerade. It is further implied that the others started taking over a lot of Dharma's infrastructure and gaining a controlling interest of their assets and resources. There are some supplementary materials that indicate the Hanso Foundation cut funding to the De Groots and the initiative in 1987. Which means Dharma would have started to hemorrhage money and collapse financially not long after. Considering how expensive an operation the whole island project was, perhaps the initiative was bought out and taken over by another organization. A small but growing company called Mitalos Bioscience. We can assume that the creative brain behind the initiative, Karen and Gerald de Groot, and their remaining Ann Arbor team were either threatened into walking away or outright killed. Eventually, within the space of a few short years, Dharma ceased to be run by actual Dharma members. The lamp post was taken over by Eloise Hawking shortly after the brains and money behind the initiative were eradicated. The epilogue reinforces the idea that the others, whilst under Ben's leadership, had absorbed the remnants of the initiative both on and off the island. And this is why the pallet drops continued for years afterwards. We even see Ben handing out severance pay to the warehouse employees and relieving them of their posts. He does this with knowledge and authority because his people have been managing Dharma operations for the past 20 years. The question we need to ask now is, why would the others still require this resupply drop service to continue after the purge? And who was benefiting from these drops? One of the only members of the Dharma Initiative to survive the purge on the island, who didn't defect beforehand, was Stuart Radzinski. He was left largely alone to continue his work in the hatch, pushing the button and preventing another catastrophic meltdown. It is heavily implied that the resupply drops were intended exclusively for the men pushing the button down in the swan. 
it is this channel's hypothesis that Radzinski was spared during the purge for one reason, and one reason only. Because he was the last man left on the island with the technical understanding of how the Swan Station actually worked, from its electromagnetic fluctuations to the computer equipment that monitored the activity. He designed the Swan's reactor core, and the fail-safe system intended to destroy both the reactor and the energy pocket. The Swan was his brainchild. So, he was far too integral and valuable to kill. Especially since the hatch was all that stood between existence and Armageddon. So, a new truce was brokered between him and the others. Charles Widmore would allow him to live if he kept pushing the button. Almost like a form of ongoing penance for creating this catastrophic problem in the first place. As long as Radzinski continued to save the world, he would remain exempt from the purge. In return for his work, he would receive quarterly supply drops to replenish his food. And he would be given a hatch partner to enable the work to be carried out without any further incident. If you'll pardon the pun. However, his shift partners for the Swan could not just be any old recruit from the mainland. He would need people who were disciplined and capable of handling this kind of environment and routine for long periods of time. Those that had both discipline and the ability to handle high stress conditions. In other words, recruits with military training. This channel puts forward the notion that Mikhail Bakunin was Radzinski's original hatch partner. This speculation is based on several pieces of evidence. The first is that Mikhail was a former Soviet soldier with both field experience and a background in communications. Therefore he had the required experience necessary to handle life in the hatch. Secondly, he wears a Dharma jumpsuit 20 years after Dharma was eradicated as an operational entity. There is no reason for him to wear it other than the simple fact that it is his uniform. One of several he was no doubt issued with. He also claims that he answered an advertisement in a newspaper that asked readers, would you like to save the world? While his story turns out to be riddled with lies and misdirection, there is always a little bit of truth in every fabrication. We can also place Mikhail in the Swan Station based on one simple connection that we see highlighted in Season 2 episode, The Other 48 Days. The missing reel from the orientation film that Radzinski edited out was found locked away in a storage chest at the Arrow. Along with a glass eye. The only character that we ever meet on the island with a missing eye is Mikhail. He was stationed with Radzinski for a period of time. And it may or may not have been his mission to spy on his hatch partner and learn the ways of the swan. In fact, Radzinski no doubt had several hatch partners over the years, who came and went under the condition that they would be relieved regularly by their replacements. Perhaps sent over from the mainland in order to rotate the men out regularly. It is hard to imagine anyone agreeing to pushing the button full time. But, this supervised series of checks and balances would have eventually come to an end. Whichever purge date you subscribe to, Kelvin Inman's story need not contradict either. Because he was recruited quite some time after the Horace Goodspeed era had ended, and long after Charles Widmore had been overthrown by Ben. We know that the others recruited and accepted people with military or mercenary backgrounds judging from characters like Mikhail. But also Danny Pickett, Ryan Price, and his right-hand man Jason. All of whom demonstrated militaristic training and were often sent in to handle stealth operations, such as abductions and ambushes. It is entirely possible that Kelvin was someone they brought in through similar channels. If Ben was still stringing along Dharma headquarters in Ann Arbor then Kelvin could have been selected via the initiatives off-island recruitment process. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter if Kelvin was recruited by the others or Dharma back in Michigan. All that matters is that he was brought to the island during a time of transition in which Ben was seizing power in the 1990s. He was placed in the hatch with an expectation that he would be replaced in the coming months. But, much like Desmond, Kelvin would eventually discover the truth of his situation. That he was trapped down there, pushing this button based on lies and half-truths, and that the people on the island who were supposed to be friendly, were actually hostile. The rules of working in the hatch were simple. Button men always had to make sure the button was pushed, and that they should take alternating shifts. However, there were other caveats. Like the original truce, button men would not be able to stray into unfriendly territory up above. Anything outside of their sector would be considered hostile territory. And Radzinski would have insisted on wearing hazmat suits when leaving the station. This seemingly paranoid protocol was not entirely without merit. 
In point of fact, following the fallout from the incident in 1977 and the toxic gas released during the purge, Radzinski's precautionary measures were entirely justified. For all he knew, the others could release the gas again whilst he was retrieving supplies from the pallet drop. Every time either he or Kelvin went up top became a potential risk to their lives. In a future video, we will explore the specific reasons why the others did not try to kill the hatchmen, or try to take back control of the hatch. Radzinski eventually had enough of paying his penance. If the hatch finished construction in the late 1970s, and if he had been pushing that button from the start, that means he would have spent two decades down in the swan. That's enough time to drive anyone to depression and despair. After all, Desmond was ready to commit suicide after only three years trapped in that same routine. Radzinski had become a prisoner inside his own station, with no hope of reprieve or a way out. So, he killed himself, leaving Kelvin alone. And it meant that the hatch was no longer being manned by someone with an understanding of the science or the history behind it all. Or with a line of communication to the hostiles up above. The hostiles had a bloody history with Dharma. And Radzinski no doubt made Kelvin aware of this and the purge, which would have fueled the man's paranoia. All of Radzinski's protocols and teachings would have influenced Kelvin's gun-toting behavior, which he later passes on to Desmond. Kelvin knew enough about the hostiles to be wary of their intentions, although it is never specified if he ever had any personal interactions with them. Either way, the men in the hatch were likely to shoot strangers first and feel well within their rights. We see how Desmond is hostile to any strangers he encounters. We see this at the start of Season 2 in how he engages non-threats like Kate, Locke and Jack. And again when Faraday knocks on the hatch door. He gets a gun in his face straight away. The Hatch men did not trust anyone from outside the swan. This all stems from Radzinski's training of Kelvin, and Kelvin's training of Desmond. We know that Kelvin eventually felt safe enough to go up top for walkabouts. Although leaving the Hatch most likely started as a necessity to retrieve supplies from the pallet drop. And this is what he was probably doing when he came across Desmond washed up on the beach. Kelvin then perpetuates the same cycle of manipulating someone into pushing a button without knowing why or for how long. Ultimately, the point of exploring Kelvin Inman's backstory here is to explain how his presence neither confirms nor refutes the date of the purge. Because he was definitely recruited after Dharma had already been wiped out on the island. In conclusion, the year that the purge takes place is largely dependent on how you feel about the sequence of events in Season 5 Episode Dead is Dead, and the reason for why Ben and Ethan are with the others in the middle of the night in 1988. It also depends on how you think Ben raised Alex between 1988 and 1992. Did he do this whilst living amongst the others in the jungle, or did he do this whilst still with the Dharma Initiative on the barracks? There is no definitive answer that will wholly satisfy the speculation about a purge date. It is true that a 1987 purge allows breathing room for Ben to raise Alex as his own without any complications. It gives him stronger motivations for wanting to move back into the barracks and to evolve his people out of the wild and into something more civilized. This speaks to the idea that the others were split from within about Ben and the barracks, with many choosing to remain at the temple rather than integrating with the Dharma lifestyle. However, it is just as plausible that Ben raised Alex within the initiative for five years and merely concocted a story about how he found her or rescued her. It wouldn't be the first time that Dharma took in strays that had apparently washed up on the island. A 1987 purge might help to explain why Ben, and more importantly, Ethan, are with the others in the middle of the night. They are on their first official mission, hence why Ethan is so eager to get involved. Then again, we know that Ben was living a double life for years, going back and forth between the others and Dharma whilst recruiting sympathetic initiative members in secret. Before a purge were to take place, the others would need to know that potential defectors could be trusted, which means they would require them to carry out certain tasks to prove their worth. We know that Widmore was reluctant and hesitant about Ben from the very start, so it makes sense that he would test the mettle of him and any other defectors ahead of time. Whilst we're talking about Charles Widmore, if Ben overthrew him sometime during the late 1980s, it would allow Widmore enough time to be back on the mainland and building up his business empire. After all, Desmond comes to his company looking for work in 1995, which would have been only a few years after Widmore was allegedly exiled following the purge of 92. 
then again, Whitmore Industries could have already been around long before 1992 and already well established as a company. We know that Whitmore had been leaving the island regularly to live an off-island life and that companies like Mitalos Bioscience could be managed from an island base. Many might argue that a 1987 purge would explain why the radio tower had become abandoned and why Russo could change the broadcast of the Valenzetti equation in 1988 without Dharma ever returning to change it back. But, it was indicated that the radio tower had been abandoned by Dharma for some time before Russo's arrival. This might have been part of their truce with the hostiles. Perhaps the radio tower was built in a no-go zone. If Dharma abandoned it, they likely weren't monitoring its broadcast anymore. Therefore, Russo could change the message without any plot contradictions. Russo claimed that she never encountered people on the island in all the years she was there, even though that turns out to not be entirely true. She possessed a strong knowledge of the island's geography, enough to have drawn up a fairly competent map. This means that, at the very least, she walked much of the shoreline. However, we also know that Dharma were running errands all over the island in their vans, ferrying supplies back and forth to the various stations. So, is it possible that Russo would never have encountered any of them during her travels? Surely, there would have been more than enough activity to catch Russo's attention in those five years. Well, the answer to this question is explained within the show. Russo specifically says that she has avoided confrontations with anyone, hence how she had survived for so long. So, if she was actively avoiding people then it's possible that she would have remained hidden from Dharma, deep in the jungle. On the surface, a 1987 purge date appears to plug more leaks than it ultimately creates. But these theoretical suppositions about 1987 can be challenged with logical counterpoints. And no matter how much we try to make 1987 work, it simply cannot beat the canonical exposition that is given within the show itself. That's probably because I've been dead for 12 years. Dream Horace's statement is almost impossible to explain away logically, and it remains the only line of dialogue in the entire show that overtly tells us what year the purge took place in. As a viewing audience, we must reconcile what works best for the story. As in, what makes the most sense when we view all of the evidence actually presented in the show. Forget the contrary interviews, and encyclopedias, and supplementary materials on DVD box sets, and other online trivia. Always remember to trust the tale and not the teller, and to let the show speak for itself. In 100 years' time, Lost will have become a cultural artifact of the early 21st century. And many of these supplementary materials will be lost to time. A person watching the show in the future will only have one conclusive piece of evidence available to them when trying to decipher the year in which the purge took place. And that year is 1992. Ultimately, the purge is less of a mystery that needs to be answered, and more of a debate to be had within the fanbase itself. Weigh up the evidence for yourself. Choose what best suits your reading of the series. It is up to you how you reconcile the flashback scenes from Season 5 Episode Dead is Dead, with the information given in Season 4 Episode, Cabin Fever. Thank you for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to keep this channel alive and share your own opinions in the comments below on which year you believe the purge took place. Until the next time, stay lost.